Cool. So hello, everybody, and welcome to our Compass seminar for today. We're very happy to have Dr. Dahlia Kirschbaum speaking with us. She's the director of the Earth Sciences Division at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and she'll be giving us a talk today titled Exploring Earth, Your Planet, Our Mission. A little background on her, she received her bachelor's in geosciences from Princeton University and her MS and PhD in earth and environmental sciences from Columbia, and her research specifically focuses on rainfall triggered landslide modeling. So please make sure that you mute yourself for now. We're gonna have time for some questions at the end and I will hand it over to Dr. Kirschbaum. Thank you so much. All right, let's see how we get this working. Um... All right, are you seeing, no, nope. hold on, let me switch it. Hold on, I have to switch, something just happened with my computer. All right, how are we doing? That's perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you to Nate for connecting us, and um, it is my pleasure to be here. So um, as I hope introduced, I am the director of the Earth Sciences Division at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, which is based in, uh, in Greenbelt, Maryland. It's actually the largest NASA center, and we are the largest group of Earth scientists in the world at NASA Goddard. We have about 1,300 people looking at our atmosphere, the surface, the subsurface, modeling, instrument, and satellite development. And so today, um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about what we've been doing and keep it a bit broad, but start to unpack some of the new activities that are happening with the focus in some of our integrated um, modeling work as well as our oceans activities. But I wanted to start big picture because I know all of you know that NASA does earth science, but many don't. And so the questions that you know, we seek to, to answer at NASA are questions such as, you know, how did we get here? What are the conditions for Earth-like planets in the future and, and how do they form? Do any planets that we found have conditions to support life? And then what makes us unique? And, and really what makes us unique is liquid water on the surface, right? Understanding water in an atmosphere that protects us. So we have so many different aspects of how we're investigating some of these key questions. One example is, for example, looking at Mars. You know, we have our moon to Mars initiative working to uh, with through Artemis to set up um, you know, more engagement and participation of astronauts on the moon and then using that to better understand and and move forward to send humans to Mars. Um, we this is an example of the Curiosity rover and that team has found that there are organic salts that are likely present on Mars and, and also kind of highlights the potential for unraveling the chemistry of Mars um, billions of years ago to better understand what could have supported life in modern day Mars habitability. You know, going, going a little bit further, Europa is, is one of the places that we are, we're looking to go to to send new missions to better understand where in the solar system we can look for life beyond Earth. We know that we have, you know, Jupiter's ice covered moon Europa it has this salty global ocean with liquid water that all of Earth combined, but it doesn't have the atmosphere to support it. So, under to support life. So, understanding what types of microbes could be in the subsurface of Europa is a really exciting challenge that we're pursuing in this next decade. And then, looking a little bit further, this question is of the Goldilocks planets, right? Where do we have? planets that are maybe too, not too hot, not too cold, but just right to sustain life. And so looking at what we call these exoplanets, these, these planets and other solar systems around single stars, we can start to uncover these signatures of is there life. And then I would be remiss if I didn't at least talk a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope that launched in Christmas Day last year. And these are the first views that it had. This is this is a view, just amazing view of stars form, forming in the Carina Nebula and understanding the origins of these stars and all the planets that gets around them gives us these clues, the, the most um, exciting insight we have into how we all started forming uh, in terms of planets and even our own Earth um, looking 13 billion years ago. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about Earth because I... As much as I like space, I think that we have a lot to understand about our home planet. And so NASA's mission statement is really to improve life here, 
to extend life and understand that question and find life beyond. But when we look to Earth, we have over two dozen satellites and instruments really seeking, with their eyes pointed down on Earth, seeking to understand how our Earth is changing, what our global systems look like, what has caused these changes in the Earth system, and how might they change in the future. And then finally, how might these systems provide societal benefit, right? How are we understanding the vantage point from space in the air and on the ground? NASA does all of that. How do we understand Earth as an integrated system for the benefit of all? Now, um, we have all of these different missions that we work with our partners, um, both domestically and internationally, to realize those goals. And you can see the different colors of satellites indicate the level of formulation. We also have important international partners for missions that I'll talk about, like the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, like PACE, which hopefully many of you know about, that is coming up in January of 2024 launch. Um, and so all of these weave this tapestry of us helping to better understand our Earth, providing free and open data, and working with our partners to evaluate, calibrate, the data, build the instruments, launch these satellites. So it is a global effort to understand our Earth as it should be. And at NASA, we are working and looking globally to do that. So we don't just do this as a back, in a vacuum, right? We need to understand, this is, I call this the beach ball of different slices of Earth, how we are understanding how our atmosphere is changing, how our biosphere is changing, how that may impact our oceans, as well as looking into the atmosphere. How are we understanding our clouds and modeling of processes to connect atmosphere to ground to subsurface? So one of the important missions that we um, have up right now is called ISAT-2. And we've also had several airborne campaigns to really look at the Arctic. Um, and I bring this up first because this is quite the harbinger of, of understanding climate change and, and what that means for the rest of the world. So this is a view of Arctic sea ice minimum extent in area. And this is millions of, cubic, of, um, of square kilometers. And you can see the changing Arctic sea ice and the shrinking area over time. And, and you can see as this, obviously it's not, um, it, it, it bounces up and down based on lots of different teleconnections, different cycles that we have, but we are intending to look not only at the area extent, but actually the depth of the sea ice, the strength. And this has huge implications for understanding ship movement in the Arctic, for understanding where um, transportation corridors, even for national security, how we understand the navigability of these zones. And so satellites having their their instruments pointed in this area have this critical long-term data set to help us understand real-world applications as well as these long-term trends. So going to our atmosphere, one of the missions that I have um, a very close relationship to, I've been working on it for over a decade um, as a deputy project scientist for the mission, is the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. So this is a unique satellite because it works with a constellation of other satellites, both domestic and international, to give us this global view of where it's raining and snowing on Earth, from the Arctic to the tropical regions, and help us understand where and when our rain is coming from and where it could impact us in terms of extreme events. So I just pulled this, this is the last seven days of rain pulled from last night. And so you can see these gigantic storm systems swirling around the southern hemisphere. You can see major systems developing, right? We are not out of hurricane season. You can start to see some of those in, um, in Mexico, impacted Mexico, as well as some major systems um, transitioning to extratropical systems and traversing across the Atlantic. And so by being able to connect how much it's snowing in these Arctic regions to where these extremes may be impacting us in Maryland, in Florida, and in Minnesota, it gives us these really important connections that we need to understand hazards, which we'll talk about, and, and how we understand water and its movement around our Earth. So speaking of hazards, um, this is an example of uh, Hurricane Fiona. Um, and so this, you can see a cross section of this. So the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission has two advanced instruments on board. It was launched in 2014. 
And it, it can look three dimensionally through the clouds to better understand the three dimensional precipitation structure of storms like Hurricane Fiona. So with the top, you see this blue, that's actually snow and ice on top of hurricanes. The first time you can actually observe that from space over the oceans. And so these, these dark purple regions indicate very heavy precipitation in the form of rain, all the way to um, green is lighter precipitation. But this type of information is really vital for operational agencies such as NOAA's National Hurricane Center, the Naval Research Lab, to use that to better understand storm intensification and movement, as well as precipitation structure, and when it could cause inland flooding, for example, because of extreme rainfall totals. So moving forward a storm to Hurricane Ian, um, I probably do not have to talk to you about the um, implications of Hurricane Ian for Florida. Um, but what, what we can talk about is actually what we can see from satellites to better understand this storm. Um, so this is a view um, from this NOAA GO satellite. So it is the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite 16. And what many people don't realize is actually that NASA builds all of NOAA's satellites, especially in the weather area. So the jet, um, Joint Polar Satellite System goes and then launches them and then NOAA operates them. So there's this very important synergy between NASA and NOAA in understanding weather and, um, and ocean activities as well. So this is the eye of the storm right before it was making landfall. And what we can understand, we can see that, first of all, the extent of this storm just in the optical version uh, of this image. But then we can also start to uncover what the precipitation looked like as it was making its way through the Caribbean and ultimately into Florida. And so what you see here is this is rainfall accumulations from the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission's multi-satellite product, which is called iMERGE. And this allows you to see one, this is the hurricane tracks data set from NOAA, but it allows you to see the totals of precipitation. Um, in, in addition to understanding those gauges over land, we can, we can understand where it's coming from, right? We can see where the storm is accumulating the most rainfall. You can see that even though there was a tremendous amount of rainfall over Florida, there actually was even more before it made landfall. And, and so you can start to, to understand the dynamics between how much rainfall is occurring and how that impacts the ecosystems and vegetation below. So this is an example of, this is a Landsat image pre, right before the hurricane made landfall. And this is the impact that you can see after, after the storm made landfall, just a couple of days after it moved offshore. And you can see how much sediment has been kicked up, how the ocean has changed that we can see from space using, using Landsat imagery. And if you zoom in actually, to the um, Cape Coral area in Sanibel Island, you can see these sediment plumes that also are laced with pollution are coming off of these river channels. And so with, the, um, with these instruments from Landsat and what we'll talk about uh, shortly from the PACE satellite, we can start to understand the, the suspended sediment in the water the understanding of where we have chlorophyll content that could um, lead to toxic algal blooms or other kind of algae uh, related issues in the ocean. And of course, how that impacts the ecosystems, how it impacts fisheries, how it impacts reefs, et cetera. Not here, um, just here, but around the world. And so Landsat 9 um, is operating and we are working on the next generation of Landsat with the US Geological Survey. But I just want to emphasize that all of these images, all of the data is freely available for download. And it is in many different formats to allow us to really unpack the different aspects of, of um, how to use this data. Another thing I wanted to highlight from Hurricane Ian is actually is the role that sea surface temperature plays in hurricane intensification. So this is a sea surface temperature image. You can see the, the warm temperatures in the Gulf which um, were one of the main drivers of um, the hurricane intensification and the reason why it got to such a strong category four that it did. Um, and so understanding the temperature and the depth of that warm pool of water, can we can help to understand how this acts as fuel for the storm. And, and we've seen that through many different examples of hurricanes intensifying in the Gulf. We have this warm pool of water that actually as the storm passes over, there's more energy to suck up and like a heat engine, that's how it uses to, to increase its intensity. 
gentrification. But what I think is also really interesting is that we can also see the impacts of these storms after they've moved past the region. So because the storms are churning up this water, this warm pool of water, and there's colder water below, this cold water wake that we see helps us understand the dynamic of hurricanes as well. So you can see the cool wake, water wake from Hurricane Earl, which is in early September, the cooling path that, that Fiona had, and then Hurricane Ian as it's about to make landfall. And so you start to see the dynamics of storms even crossing um, cold uh, pools of water and slowing down and decreasing their intensity because of the ocean dynamics. And we know that as sea surface temperatures are increasing, we understand that while we may not have more frequent hurricanes, we expect that there will be more energy in the system to create more intense storms. Now, in terms of how that impacts people, we also have satellites that can be used to understand human impacts. So what you see here is actually from the NASA NOAA SUNY MVP Beers instrument, and this is called the Day Night Band or the Night Lights um, uh, product. And so on the left, you see Fort Myers, Cape Coral, you see the lights associated with those populations. And on the right, you see the power outages right after the stormy landfall. Now, while this is really uh, both scary and impressive to see from space, this type of information is critical to first responders, to the National Guard and other groups, including FEMA that we communicate with, working again with our operational partners to provide this understanding from space so that they can better respond on the ground, understand where there may be flooding, where there may be extensive power outages that they don't have visibility into, and where they can better um, install generators to support those communities. And this is especially vital for more remote communities where getting those to those areas um, that could be blocked by trees, by flooding, um, washed out roads, um, having this vantage point of space is critical. Now I want to pivot to a, a bit of a global picture because while I'm showing one specific example from Hurricane Ian and the important role that NASA plays in helping to support and enable operational agencies in the United States and around the world, I want to go back to our global view because that is the unique aspect of how NASA does our science is, is looking at how the Earth is changing, is breathing globally every day. So this is one of my more favorite um, visualizations, and it shows the vegetation as shown as NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, along with ocean chlorophyll. Um, and you can see the dead zones in the ocean where you have sinking air that where there's really not a lot of nutrients, and then these nutrient-rich sediment plains coming off of the major river basins. You can see the Mississippi, you can see the um, Am Amazon River, et cetera. And then you can see the changes of vegetation so one of the things that we're hoping to, we're, we're working to understand in this next decade and continue to do that with what we call our program of record, our group of satellites and instruments that are, are really understanding these processes is to look at aerosol particles and, um, and the relationship with ocean forcings as well. So one of the things that, um, that the mission case, which we'll talk about next does, is trying to understand the role of aerosol particles in understanding climate, right? And so what you see here is this is actually from, um, I believe, the National Academies panel. And you can see that and in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, also highlights this, that we have the largest uncertainty in the area of, of aerosols and the precursors. So understanding mineral dust, sulfates, nitrates, organic carbon, black carbon. And those have a huge impact on the albedo and the energy exchange in the atmosphere and on the surface in terms of how those aerosols are absorbed. So we know that CO2 is rising. And the question that we're seeking to answer with these new missions is how are the oceans and atmospheres responding to that? How are ecosystems changing? What are the ecosystems um, that drive within these that are driving changes? And what is the dual Inter, the um, integrated view of how we can do this. And so we know that we need coincident measurements of the ocean biogeochemical cycles, as well as the atmosphere to fully understand those coupled processes. And so the way that we're doing that is with the PACE mission. So I just put this in, I just put this in last minute, but um, 
The PACE mission is the Plankton, Aerosol, Cloud, and Ocean Ecosystem Mission. And it's set for launch in January of 2024. So this is me and uh, my deputy, Tom Newman, who is the also the project scientist of ISAC2, which I mentioned before, in front of the replica of PACE. PACE is fully assembled I can, um, in terms of, of the bus. So that's what we have behind us. And, um, and the instruments are starting to be integrated. Obviously, we would not be able to touch it if it was the real satellite, but they need to put the, the actual bus um, through the ringer to understand the forces that it will experience in space. And so they use a replica um, for some of those experiments. Um, and so PACE is seeking to better understand ocean color. So what is it, right? Ocean color. You, it reflects different types of the electromagnetic spectrum and based on the type of water, if it's clear water, if it's sediment rich water, it actually has different signatures in the electromagnetic spectrum um, in terms of visible color. And we're able to differentiate different types of ocean from these signatures. And so the spectral distribution and um, of these, of the, this, uh, the different types of water can help us under for infer the content of the water column. And that tells a lot about the type of ecosystems that exist there, as well as, um, as examples such as, as the impacts that we have on, um, um, on, on broader systems. So this is actually an image from Landsat, um, but hopefully we will have these gorgeous images from PACE shortly. Um, and this highlights this um, idea of the fact that uh, phytoplankton and pollution and sediments can all be seen with visible light. And what you're seeing here is, is actually the Mackenzie River Delta, and it's part of the uh, Canadian Boreal Forest area. And it's actually the largest drainage after the Mississippi in North America. So understanding the ecosystems, the relationship with permafrost that exists in this region is critical to understanding climate change and understanding what can survive and what will be uh, evolving as we our climate changes. And then coming a little bit closer to population centers, um, we can also use this information to understand critical um, zones such as toxic algal blooms. So this is Lake Erie, and you see this eerie image of Lake Erie. Sorry for the pun, but the green areas actually show toxic algal, algal blooms very close to population centers. And so this data is used and is being continuing to be honed to actually issue alerts in, in the Great Lakes for toxic algal blooms that not only can impact fish, but can impact human health, right? You can't swim in a toxic algal bloom. That's a very bad idea. So the relationship between leveraging this data and understanding ocean and lake health for populations, for um, ecosystems, aquatic animals, and land animals is critical. So PACE is, is really focused on addressing some science questions, and I know we have people in the room that probably could recite them better than I, but really looking at these ocean geochem biogeochemical cycles and really taking stock of, of where we are and how we can understand this in a long-term record of ocean viewing satellites that we've had for a long time. But the wavelength, the spectra that we have on board PACE is, is pretty it's unprecedented. And so we are so excited about what we are going to learn about long-term changes in the relationship between aerosols, cloud properties, and how they relate to climate signals. And finally, of course, how those connect to broader, um, to broader teleconnections. So I want to pivot a little bit to talk about oceans in a different context, right? Let's talk about El Nino. So this is um, some interesting new visualizations that I found recently that highlight sea surface temperature anomalies, right? So the difference from normal um, and how that changes with the El Nino index, right? So you can see that El Nino index and temperature anomalies on average in that box highlighted um, and how that changes based on El Nino and La Nina conditions. Well, when you see it this way, right? So you can, you can see that you know, you see a strong El Nino, you strong, strong La Nina right there. That's important, right? It's important for weather patterns because we know some areas get more rain during El Nino. Storms are different during strong El Nino and La Nina phases. But something I think people haven't connected yet is actually how sea surface temperature anomalies impact vegetation and other signatures that impact disease. And so this is the same 
image, the same visualization, but overlaid with disease outbreaks of different kinds. So the dengue fever you see in pink, you see um, cholera impacts in blue, and, and Zika, you start to see it um, with these changes in El Nino. Now, I'm gonna keep going here because cholera, we know, is a waterborne disease that happens with ex extreme precipitation, um, coupled with you know, non-sanitary conditions, environments. We see cholera outbreaks frequently after major storms um, because of the, um, the movement of uh, contaminated water into population centers. We know that dengue and the presence of malaria um, are, are highly correlated with, with extreme precipitation in vegetation areas, and we've seen that correlation over time. And so really understanding, this really underscores to me the teleconnections that we need to understand, um, understand these types of human impacts from big long-term signals that we can monitor from space. So I'm gonna stick with this a little bit and kind of zoom into South Africa. And this is specifically related, let's see if I can get this playing. Oh, no, okay, we're gonna to go to the next, oh, there we go. Um, so this is showing specifically the precipitation anomaly and you'll start to see the impact of Rift Valley fever. Um, and so again, kind of zooming into a location, by having a, an understanding of when there may be an El Nino, how that can impact incidences of Rift Valley fever and other things such as drought, which could impact crop insecurity and food insecurity, which is also um, shown in Africa. We have some predictive power for these major issues. And so with groups like the Famine Early Warning System, which is a combination of the of NASA, the US Geological Survey, the US uh, Agency for International Development, um, and others, we are pulling together pictures of understanding food insecurity around the world by being able to couple precipitation anomalies with vegetation changes and other human factors. So, you know, just highlighting, this is just pulling it together, but you can see that you know, the impacts that El Nino causes and other larger systems that are manifested in our oceans have long ranging global impacts to, to different types of impacts that we see um, around the world. So not only can we see drought, but we see changing fire regimes during El Nino's in different seasons and being able to better predict those helps operational responders in these countries um, along with fire weather prediction to improve their ability to be more responsive to these extreme fire seasons. All right, changing to water underground. Um, you know, I really want to emphasize the coupled system between humans and how satellites connect to our daily lives in different ways. So another way is looking at groundwater. So the GRACE satellite and GRACE follow-on are two satellites that actually work in tandem and are calibrated to within a, a, a basically the width, width, the width of a human hair. And so as they move over different areas of the world, they can sense gravity anomaly changes with, for example, changes in groundwater. So here you can see that in Brazil, there was a major water crisis. There was a major water crisis and with grace, we actually could see the water deficits going down. You see the location of reservoirs with the visualization and then you actually see the population centers. So we can see the natural variation caused by changing groundwater. You see, you know, positive or blues indicate massive amounts of water, whereas yeah, uh, the orange indicates deficits. But we can also see where humans are pumping more groundwater out of the earth than they are replenishing it. And, and we can see those, those signatures as well. So Grace follow-on is up now, actually, as several of my colleagues were in Germany last week talking about what's next. And, and what we're learning here, how we can make that data more actionable for communities. But you can see the power that it has in, in sensing what we're seeing underground. And then just lastly, I wanted to have, in, in terms of some of these signatures before we talk about what's next, I want to, um, to highlight the fact that with a long running continuous view of our earth, that we can get a better sense of of how things are changing and how our our human system is interacting with the natural system. So I'm going to pop quiz for anybody. Does anybody know what city this is? 
you can unmute. I'll give you a second. Try again. If I told you this was Lake Mead shrinking. Yeah, Las Vegas. Nice. So the yeah, nice. So the the red indicates vegetation. You can see the greening up of Vegas. You can actually see the strip if you uh, and the, the airstrip and the strip if you look closely enough. But you also see the fact that Lake Mead is shrinking in unprecedented ways, and we've seen that even more with the recent droughts. So we can do this for any city around the world, right? You can go into Google Earth Engine. And you can actually look at any city in the world with Landsat data and see evolution over time. And you can do that in our oceans too. So I encourage you to play with this data. This is really powerful information to better understand the connections that we have. So pivoting a bit to climate change, I did want to highlight what we're learning and, and what our role is as NASA in understanding climate change. So, the administrator, Administrator Nelson, has highlighted climate change and, and being more climate conscious and limiting our carbon footprint as being a high priority, one of the highest priorities of NASA right now. And so we do many things to contribute to the national understanding and information related to climate change. One is, is monitoring and observing. So this is actually a long-term climate record provided by GIS. And, um, and what you see is that when we talk about global warming, we talk about climate change, the warming is not uniform, right? We are building more stuff in harm's way. Minorities are impacted much more in disadvantaged areas um, to climate change impacts with very little coping capacity. And, and this is also, they're disproportionately impacted by disasters. And so we are learning much more about how to reduce loss of life from these impacts and these modeling, understanding how things have changed and how it may change in the future are fundamental to improving the coping capacity of our populations, our climate, um, and our societies going forward. So this is a little busy, but I wanted to highlight this because this is climate change looking at different variables, right? So this is all models. Um, and so on the bottom, you have the ocean heat content. Um, in the middle, you have the sea surface temperature anomalies. Here you have the lower stratosphere, and then you have the mid stratosphere. And so the question of what is driving climate change is the, this is the purpose of this specific um, visualization, right? So the black indicates the observations. The green indicates natural drivers only, right? If humans didn't exist, what would happen going forward? And then the red indicates human drivers only and blue is together, right? And so what if you look at the surface temp temperature, right? So you look at the differences in surface temperature, you start to see over time that you know we have the um, you can see the change that we have and the divergence. If it was only a natural signal, we wouldn't be going up, right? So these models are part of a large international um, set of models that allow us to understand variations and different scenarios of human behavior going forward. And so this is something that our, our chief, our chief uh, scientist and our, chief, our senior climate scientist, Kay Calvin, has expertise in and, and really trying to move forward with a climate strategy for NASA that highlights what we know what our models bring to the table and how we are part of the solution with our other government agencies, both at the national and the international level. Okay, so this is all models, right? But we need data to inform those models. We can't just create a model and let it run. We need to anchor it with important data. So understanding how we are changing requires new measurements. And so what we're doing now is we are working on developing new missions to address those big questions that have been set forth by the National Academy of Arts of Sciences um, in a study called the Decadal Survey. And it lists these five main areas in what they're calling an Earth System Observatory to develop missions to address these big questions. And so just going through what we're doing, the first is looking at clouds, convection, and precipitation, understanding the interactions between clouds and storm development and precipitation around the world, especially in an extreme uh, environment, and then how aerosols relate both at the surface and higher up. 
We're also looking to advance our understandings of mass change, how those gravitational changes are happening, and then how that's manifested at the surface. And lastly, we have looking at surface biology and geology, you know, working with our international partners to really get at what those types of, of, um, of types of uh, changes are. And so this is going to be part of an observatory. But what I wanted to, um, to emphasize is that um, we have so much data that we have now, and with the advent of new satellites, such as, as the NASA ISRO SAR mission, NISAR, which will also launch in January of 2024, we have an, an immense amount of data that we are harnessing for this picture, right? So what you're seeing here is kind of complicated, but you see the amount of data that gets assimilated into the models I've been showing every six hours. So right now, we have 5 million observations that go into assimilate, so bringing into these climate and, and land surface models that we have. So you see uh, plane tracks, you see ship tracks to a certain extent, you see our, our low inclination satellites that are orbiting kind of um, around the poles, we have um, GPS, we have other um, of other different sounders around the world um, from, from ground-based systems. So all of these are coming into models that we have. And in order to really put this piece together, to go from what you just saw to this, to understand our aerosols and our interconnected nature of things, this is another visualization I can um, stare at for a while, we need to understand and have the data to support that integration and then the infrastructure to make it happen. So, um, so this is an example from the 2017 hurricane season. Um, this shows these dust plumes off of Africa, which form the nuclei for storms to form. This is Hurricane Irma. You can see Jose and Maria will be right behind it, unfortunately. Um, you can that those are shown in sea salt. And at the same time, you can see these sulfate, the smoke coming from the wildfires out west, making their way across the US and affecting air quality in, in, on the East Coast and even into Europe. Um, and so by, this is a model, right? But we need to anchor that and assimilate information into these structures to create um, basically replications of, of how our Earth system works. And so there's actually a meeting going on right now um, in Washington, D.C. about digital twins and how we understand and advance that concept of basically creating a digital environment where we can better understand these concepts. And so this example of this global modeling effort is, is a digital twin, right? It's how we represent the systems together and not as independent um, processes, independent rain, soil moisture, et cetera, capabilities. Okay, so what's next, right? What's this view forward? Well, um, one is that NASA is you know, focusing its NASA Earth science is about $2 billion with its satellite and airborne missions that are seeking to not only continue records where it makes sense, where we're able to sustain it with our budgets, but what new measurements we can do. What can we push the envelope on to better understand some of these complex interactions between, between aerosols on the surface and ocean chemistry, et cetera. We then have a strong research program, so NASA funds um, research in the community as well as, as its own researchers to better understand and, and develop different um, capabilities, either it's algorithm development, it's new research capabilities that can transition, et cetera. Now those have to be anchored in, in models to a certain extent, right? So we have different types of, of geos, which is the Goddard uh, Earth Observations system, I should know what the GEOS 5 um, stands for, and we also have the land information system coming out of the hydrology group, which allows us to not only look at what's happening in the atmosphere, but really look at the hydro hydrologic processes and bring in new data such as the soil water, uh, water ocean topography mission, uh, surface water ocean topography mission SWAT, um, to, to bring in and understand the, the water cycle and how it may be intensifying. And then lastly, we are um, really moving forward with work on machine learning, cloud computing, leveraging both private cloud environments as well as public to be able to learn these processes and create broader networks of information, um, improved products and gridded products, right? We don't have observations everywhere. 
and, and um, at all times. And so this is really the view forward of how we do that is to, um, to provide more advanced uh, machine learning in cloud computing. But as you see, all arrows should be pointing to each other, but they, they point to stakeholder engagement for innovation, right? So while we are seeking to pursue the next big earth science questions along with the next big space questions, we need to connect with stakeholders routinely to better understand what the needs are. And scientists are, of course, stakeholders in that equation, right? We need to understand what innovation is needed so we can work closely with industry, with our commercial partners, with our national partners to make that happen. And that dialogue is critical. And that's one of my roles as director. And so I think that you know this is a complex ecosystem um, that includes technology. So how we, can we do a better job of, of data processing? You know, nobody is, is downloading terabytes of data to do processing. They want to do it on the cloud. We want to enable those capabilities, as well as how we can replicate science through things like Jupyter Notebooks to be able to replicate capabilities and, and move them forward. And that leads into the Open Science Initiative, right? So 2023 is the year of open science. How can we create environments to allow that to happen? And also preserve preserve scientific integrity and ownership. And, and that is, I'll be honest, a really um, important and, and challenging but crucial discussions going forward. Of course, figuring out how we can transition our research, our being the community, not just NASA, but what we can contribute and move towards operations and focus on engagement and capacity building of organizations to take this data and move it forward is, is really critical. And then creating environments in which we can co-develop along with our, um, with our partners, assimilation environments that um, allow us to, to kind of create more advanced models that can be taken um, and moved forward. And, and one example is the meeting last week that we have where our land surface modeling group called LIST yeah, has a long-standing multi-decade partnership with the um, Air Force Weather Agency and other DOD partners. Now the Air Force Weather provides the um, operational weather forecast for DOD and also is moving into hydrology, understanding of, of hydrologic systems. And so they were meeting for a multi-day workshop to talk about what are the bottlenecks, how can we move this forward, what operational capabilities do they need to move forward and leverage from the research that's being done at NASA Goddard. And that also is, is trying to create test beds to expedite those types of data transitions, right? So using scenarios um, such as, for example, how Landsat data can be harnessed by local lake managers in the Great Lakes to better understand and provide more real-time updates for harmful algal blooms, right? That's an example that, um, that they're working on and that the PACE team um, with its applications program is working to find those early adopters that can work with synthetic data or existing products to be ready when PACE launches to use it for their, um, their purposes. And there's a wealth of different uh, understanding there that, um, that I think there's, we have a lot more to do and a lot more to communicate to communities of what's available. So to that end, um, you know, the question of what can you do? Well, you're already doing it. You're in programs to understand science. Um, and, and I encourage you to keep on those tracks. We need a, the next generation of scientists and technologists and sci engineers, <laughs> which is a, I don't know who made up that term, but people that can go between science and engineering um, and, and kind of robustly communicate between the two is, is a huge area of growth and need. So we make sure that we have more integrated systems. Um, so, but, you know, being informed, right? You know, understanding climate change, why the, why the earth is changing, how it's changing, and what is needed to better understand those changes. That is something that we are going, to, that we are continuing to strive to better understand. Um, and then being involved. So um, one example uh, from one of our, our labs, our Ocean Color Lab, which is in our sciences division, is about, um, it's called CBAS, which is kind of an awesome acronym, but it's about how they can bring together different ground-based capabilities um, from cruises, from experiments and other investigations to create an open repository of information that can be used by other ocean um, 
and by other communities to, to really look at questions of ocean biology. So um, I, I highly encourage you to go to, to oceancolor.gssc.nasa.gov um, to, to really look into that. There is a wealth of information um, on existing data as well as future plans. And then also highlight that there's huge outreach opportunities. I just found this in Googling last night about, um, this is our administrator, Nelson, he's from Florida, um, and awarding a major kind of three quarter million dollar grant to the Orlando Science Center to work on STEM activities. So these types of engagements are out there, the opportunities are out there, especially um, in, in really focusing on the minority serving institutions, um, HBCUs, the, um, historically black colleges. So there's a lot of opportunity to, to really work within the academic community to broaden the reach of this data and, and hopefully reach communities that may not have been uh, reached in the past. And then lastly, it's be inspired. So this is PACE. Um, hopefully when it gets into launch, um, please keep a lookout for 2024 January. We hope it stays um, in there. And I can, I can confirm that the instruments are being integrated and um, we have many exciting launches to come in our science. So um, really encourage you to, to continue to, um, to, to investigate what NASA Earth Science and on these types of data can, how it can be used for your research and for your communities. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'll be happy to make the slides available if you wanna go check out any links. And if you really liked any of the visualizations here, um, all of them are available for you to use. So um, we can, I can make sure you have the links, but they're all open for you to use in whatever capacity you want. So with that, I will stop and I'd be really happy to take questions. Stop. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Yeah, if anyone has a question, you can either put it in the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, th there was a tremendous uh, forest fire uh, around the uh, tar sands area in in Canada called the Fort McMurray fire that burned for 13 months and through two provinces. Hardly got any coverage at all. Uh, probably one of the, the major uh, CO2 emissions events uh, in recent time. Uh, is there any active effort to analyze that and to estimate what the carbon impact may have been? That's a great question. Um, here, I'll, I'll put in the chat the observations from that fire from, um, you know, this is just quickly, you know, Googling a bit. But, um, but the answer is that um, there is a new initiative right now that is um, being scoped. It's called FireSense. And so it's essentially a, an integration of technology, the technology research applications uh, and, and applications arms of NASA to start to bring together those assets to support and understand fire, the fire ecosystem pre, during, and post in new ways and how those can be modeled across. Um, and that includes kind of understanding the carbon budgets because one of my close colleagues, Doug Morton, um, they are working on um, you know, new research that suggests that, you know, that the amount of carbon coming from fires, from small fires that are undetected, um, is so much larger than initially thought, right? And I, I don't want to put numbers in there because it's still pending research and also I don't have them. But the point is, is that I think with new measurements and with new integrated modeling capabilities, we are going to be able to improve our understanding of those areas. Um, but I think the small fires, are the thing and the long burning fires are still areas where we need better systems to detect them, right? So the big fires we're able to understand because we can see the fire line, the fire perimeter. Um, I could have given a whole talk just on, on fires, um, but we are working to develop new technologies, airborne, spaceborne, to be able to understand the whole picture of fires and not just the big ones and how that is impacted also by things such as post-fire debris flows, which is an area that I've been working in a bit, to say, okay, you know, what are the pre-fire conditions for, you know, potential burning? What is happening immediately after the burn? Can we track the fire perimeter? And, and what are the aerosols related to that? And then 
in the aftermath of the storm or of the of the um, fire, what storms may trigger massive debris flows that could impact water quality, et cetera. So this is an effort that is uh, in its first year of integration. There's a meeting next week and NASA aims to talk more about that strategy, but the hope is it does exactly that, right? It addresses the different types of fires and, and the different complexities that are related to them, working closely with the operational agencies. You know, a storm like that or a fire like that burning so far north, uh, it would put out a soot plume, which probably would affect the melt of Greenland as well as the snow albedo uh, yeah. pretty much all the way around the northern hemisphere. Exactly. And, that, and models don't account for that, right? So, you know, one of my colleagues who's now the chief scientist at NOAA, Sarah Hackman, she was doing work on understanding kind of aerosol implications of, of black carbon on ice or melting and how that can be incorporated into models with her team at the global at the geophysical fluid dynamics laboratory. So yeah, I mean, we need these types of observation observations and just kind of echoes the theme of this presentation, which is the connections are very important if we're going to actually get to the levels that we can understand change at a regional scale. Well, thank you. Other questions? So I will say, if I have a second to make a plug, that, um, that NASA has tons of internships. Um, I'm gonna put it in the chat. Uh, and, and they also have, which, Apparently isn't working right now. So interns.nasa.gov should be the link. But if you search NASA internships, it's there. Um, and they also have a phenomenal postdoc program. I was one of the one I, I went through the program. Um, and it's a great gateway to get um, to work with different groups. Um, and what I encourage you to do in that process is to reach out to scientists that really you, you are interested in their research, it aligns with yours, um, and, and talk to them before you apply so that they understand kind of what you're interested in and find those connections. So I really, excuse me, encourage you to, to find those two areas uh, if you're interested in a postdoc or in a, an internship. And at NASA, we have, as I said, at Goddard, we have 1,300 people. We have a very strong ocean color lab I just met with two weeks ago and, um, and a lot of cool instrument development going on. So if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to put you in touch with the lab chief or, or some of the technologists and scientists in their lab. Okay, yeah, if no one else has any more questions, we'll probably wrap up there. But thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. And, and we would love it if you could send the slides so everyone can get the links as well. That would be great. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think our next Compass Talk is November 4th, everybody. So thank you so much for coming. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dahlia. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.